financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughnail. You're listening to the Vonnie Podcast. And welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... I'm Jeremy. Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vonnie Podcast is covered by BIPCOT's No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more <laughs> at BIPCOT's. Dot org. So, uh, so as you can clearly hear, Kyle is not with me this evening. Haven't talked to him in, uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks of exchange of emails. But uh, rather, I have a very special guest host. We don't, we aren't going to do this uh, this very often. I think probably for season three. You know, if we can find some folks that are doing this, uh, we'll obviously be happy to have them on. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I've got my guest host uh, Jeremy Hangler with me from the uh, Seeds of Liberty podcast. Uh, thanks so much for you know taking the time on pretty short notice uh, to you know come on the Vonnie podcast, man. How's it going? Hey man, I'm doing all right. Uh, yeah, not a problem. I, uh, you know, as I've expressed to you before, I'm I'm a fan of this podcast. So uh, when I saw when I saw you tagged me earlier and said, "Hey, I'm looking for somebody to fill in," I said, "Hey, I got a free night. Why not?" So here <laughs> I am. Right on, right on. Yeah, it'll be it'll it'll, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Uh, but uh, so so I guess uh, what's what's new on your end, man? Uh, what you been up to? Oh man, I'm just uh, winding, trying to wind my way down here on Long Island. Finally. Uh, it's now September, so the close of my business is coming ever closer. I officially shut down at the end of the month and uh, still trying to work on figuring out how uh, my new life is going to proceed. But, you know, it's a little harrowing, but uh, exciting all the same. So that's 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 what I've been up to. Right, right. And, and getting out of, uh, you know, I, I, I talk a lot of, you know, I obviously talk a lot of crap about the communist state of Illinois, but, uh, you know, New York's not that, not, uh, not much better. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> so, so yeah, it looks like you're, you're trying to get out of New York and I'm trying to get, uh, you know, as, as, as far away from Chicago as I possibly can, uh, down to, uh, down to Southern Illinois where, you know, government really is, doesn't exist in the, in the, uh, uh, in the country where, where I'm trying to get to. So, uh, very good. You know, glad you're, uh, your work, you're making steps towards, uh, you know, getting out of, uh, getting out of New York. So uh, this episode is titled A Visit to Vonnie Land, and the show notes can be found at vonniepodcast.com forward slash intermission six. And uh, you're going to want to check that out. I'll put links to the three articles uh, or letters we'll discuss. And uh, today we're going to look at Jim Stum's experience meeting Rayo and Roberta back in 1971, a long time ago. That's yes. A very long time ago, 20 something years since uh, before I was born. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you youngins, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually, uh, you know, from from you know additional source material, I I, I was correct, uh, and you know, guessing Ray, guessing Rayo's age, he would be eighty six. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, he's he'd be older than my grandparents. So that's uh, pretty. Pretty nuts. Now do you think? So. <laughs> uh, but uh, but first, you know, speaking of those articles and letters, I did receive the second batch of Vani publications from the 1960s to 1990s, and I did discuss that in last week's episode in that introduction. Uh, but needless to say, you know, I've been digitizing it already. Um, so the uh, the first Vani the Search for Personal Freedom book was about 38,000 words. Uh, Vani Life March 1973 was about 78,000 words, and I'm about halfway done digitizing this one. Uh, and it's already, uh, I think we're at like 15,000. So we're going to have, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when the, we, for, for, for about a full year, uh, you know, when I first discovered Vaughn, we only had, you know, that one book and it looks like, uh, our, uh, library of publications has expanded, uh, about five times what it was then. So that's pretty, uh, pretty incredible, uh, pretty incredible. So there's a bunch of other really neat publications there too. Some not related to Vaughn. Um, I'm really looking forward to the Ocean Freedom Notes, which was uh, from 1984 to 1990. I have the uh, complete set of those, uh, which mm. is uh, pretty neat. Pretty neat. Interesting. Uh, you know, folks that are actually uh, going out there and doing it. And uh, uh, yeah, it'll be it'll it'll be interesting to to look into. And then some other publications that I didn't even know Rayo put out, like Going uh, Going Mobile. Never he never mentioned it in any publications. So I don't know if that was kind of like a one shot thing or uh, or what he was doing there. But um, but yeah. Uh, Pretty, pretty incredible, man. Yeah, he's. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, you guys, you guys have obviously read more into this than I have, but just following along with the show and and reading some of the stuff you guys have put out, it's like he was definitely a very interesting guy. <laughs> and uh, this whole, this whole, 
This whole, I mean, I, I, obviously, I mean, I can understand why the ocean thing would would excite you because sea, seasteading's your your deal, right? That's that's kind of your preferred method you're you're looking at, right? The ideal for you. Uh, uh you know, if any, anything with the open ocean, yeah. Uh, I, I lean more towards uh, the minimal sailboating. Uh, as it takes oh, place yes, to come into fruition. Yeah. But, you know, the, the seasteading thing, you know, I am the communication specialist for the Marinian Project. Uh, and it's not seasteading proper. It's a little different. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do like, uh, you know, anything on the open ocean, you know, international waters, uh, preferably, uh, where there's the least amount of government. Oh, uh, hey, I'm with you, man. We actually touched on that on a recent episode of The Seeds of Liberty, where we were discussing the possibility of sending our co-host Andre out to international waters to practice law for us. And, uh, <laughs> and then we would slowly follow him out there with different projects of our own. Um, but yeah, I'm all for that. Anything you could do to escape uh, the uh, the tyranny that is that surrounds you pretty much wherever which, wherever you set foot on any any piece of land here on this on this planet you're essentially you know subject to some form even even if it may not actually come the the threat of the tyranny reaching you is still there because you know government claims you know what pretty much every single piece of land on on the on the planet including Antarctica which multiple governments all claim ownership of somehow some way. <laughs> right, right, yeah, and even you know, so even some uh, you know uninhabited ocean islands that may not even have been discovered yet. Uh, exactly. You know, they're, they're, they've already kind of uh, laid claim to all of that stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, that's uh, I, I really do think uh, as I've said many times before, uh, it really will. Uh, I, I think kind of the the logical next step will be the the open ocean. Uh, I, I, I really do. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of other strategies with Vanu uh, that I think have some have some potential, um, you know, but we, we've discussed kind of the negatives, uh, I guess, potential disadvantages for those. But, uh, you know, van nomadism, uh, you know, intentional communities, I think there's some some other good stuff that can be done on land. But uh, but obviously, that's, uh, you know, one big disadvantage is you're, you're going to have to uh, unless you're going to do kind of the uh, uh, the Agoras, right, you're going to have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, comply at least a little bit. Right. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, even me looking to get out of New York stand and go someplace that's, you know, quote unquote freer, I'll, I'll still have to deal with it. And I think, I mean, I've, we've, I've discussed intentional communities on my show before. I'm kind of a, a fan of that idea, but I, I understand the limitations to it. I understand that, you, you know, I'll still be, uh, I'll still have to deal with certain levels of coercion. I, I think realistically the only way it can, can work in the current paradigm or work, I guess I would even put in quotes because it would be, you know, um, how much it would actually work, I don't know. But I think the only way you could really pull it off right now is if you somehow purchase land within someone else's land and that you know just to add an extra layer if you know somebody has a couple hundred acres that they're willing to give you you know a hundred or less acres in the in the middle of their in the middle of their territory right. you know that's the closest you can really come right now uh, and even even then you'll still technically be subject to all the regulations and the laws and whatnot of the particular geographical location you're in for doing that but you'll have that extra layer of security of being on someone else's private land and this is of course assuming that you have a good working relationship with this person and they're they they themselves is not going to turn tyrannical on you at some point you know but even, but that's you know i think that's really the only way it could be done right now uh because that's, yeah that, that's a really yeah that's a really good point you know i i, I guess I've, I've kind of thought of that in other ways kyle and i have discussed and and this will kind of come into play more for bonnie and cities which we're, we're nearing the end of, of season two and we've got like a handful of episodes left including the concluding uh, concluding episodes so uh we're we're, all, we're almost on to season or yeah season three but uh, that'll that'll really come into play with bonnie and cities uh but uh uh you know uh, uh whether it's you know finding you know a trusted uh uh, finding, you know, a trusted guy that'll, you know, either lease you some land or sell you some land uh, without, you know, uh, transferring, you know, property titles and such. Uh, I think probably leasing would be better off because that layer of protection is there so that you don't have to deal with the property taxes or uh, nuisance abatement if it does, you know, uh, tend to come or things like that. But I, I think you're, you're you're on the right track there. Uh, I guess the other possibility, which I'm not a big fan of this one. Because uh, you're you're kind of uh, you know getting involved with uh, you know government mechanisms to try to get out of it, uh, you know like setting up a corporation and doing it that way. Uh, maybe a trust too. I, I, I've 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 seen a lot of uh, interesting stuff on trust, but a lot of that stuff comes from the sovereign citizen, so you got to be a little careful. Ye there. Yeah, that's where I first learned about all that stuff. But I have a couple of friends who went down that road a little bit, but never actually fully engaged themselves in the whole sovereign route. Um, but they picked up some tips and tricks from it. And the trust thing is another one of those things that, I mean, government at any time could tell you to go to go F yourself, you know, and that it doesn't matter even if their own you're, laws you're, state you're that they still, can't do. You're still begging. You're still begging the state. For yeah, yeah. But, you know, 
it, it's one of those things I think I, I've come around on it a little bit in the past couple of years, whereas, you know, I would prefer not to if given the choice of not having to not being able to purchase something and not being able to have my own land or something like that and having to use that type of mechanism like a trust it does seem to be the safest way to go about it because that does pile on a couple extra layers of protection on you. I mean, I, I currently have a couple of friends uh, across the country who are involved in different projects who are lo looking to do kind of what I was describing, although I don't think that was their initial plan, um, but to purchase big, big, port, you know, big tracts of land and then portion them out and, you know, sell them to people within the Liberty S community um, and try to form, you know, hopefully have these people form their own intentional communities that way. But it's all going to be done under a giant umbrella of a trust because they did the math. They looked at all the angles and said, well, if I have to play in the servile society right now, this is the best way, you know. You know, this is this is the best way to go about it. And I can see I can see the potential benefits. Of course, I can see the potential downfalls as well. But, you know, it's it's one of those things, you know, we're stuck right now. There's only so much you can do. So you can sit back and try to um, figure out better ways, which I'm not against at all. Or you can make moves with the uh, with the current paradigm, and uh, you know I, I gotta support those type of efforts in some respect at least. Right, right, and and, and Rayo, uh, you know, uh, Rayo was a little uh, he he didn't like him, and I, I'm not a big fan of him either. And they're not they're nothing to they're and I guess what I agree with Rayo on the most is you you, you don't place all your eggs in the legal interstices basket. So uh, like uh, you know what you know trust and you know corporations and such, you know those have worked for some people, uh, and uh, you know. Until there are better solutions out there, sometimes you know to become more invulnerable to coercion, there there it does have to be some utilization of some, some of some legal interstices. So I definitely understand that. Um, I I definitely do. I just hope uh, uh you know uh sometime there there are some better solutions like uh, you know hopefully there's a free market in seasteads or hopefully there's a free market in you know villages at sea uh, or or things of that nature. Uh, but yeah, working you know it we only have one like uh, I'm gonna put the we with we only have you know one life to live. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, live as a slave. So, um, I, I mean, waiting around for a free society, waiting around for, uh, you know, some of these laws to be rolled back. I mean, there's we don't have time for that. We just don't have time for that. So uh, so I, I certainly understand utilizing those legal interstices. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I said, it's not not my prefer, not my preferred method either. But, you know certain things. I mean, especially for me, man. Hey, I've, I I hit 40 already, so <laughs> I, I have a lot less of that one life to live. So, uh, you know, I may I may have to uh, re reassess my my original, you know, as far as my principles go and what I wouldn't do. <laughs> you know, it comes a time if you want to be free, if you want to have it happen now. Yeah, you may have to make some exceptions, unfortunately. But, you know, that's an that comes down to the individual. So. Right, right. So, so let's go ahead and get on with uh, you know kind of the uh, the the main uh, I guess uh, uh, topic for today. So uh, I'm gonna read uh, uh, now. This is a, a longer article, so I'm not gonna read the entire thing. Uh, I'll pull out what I feel are the most important excerpts and, and observations. Uh, but the article we're gonna kind of touch on today is uh, it's called "My Visit to Vani Land in Fall 1971" uh, by Jim Stum, and this was originally published in uh, Vani Book Two: uh, Letters from Rayo. Uh, and, and what I found really interesting about this one. Uh, is uh, obviously for you know the the publications that are for Vanu Life and, and those sorts of things. You know the the publications were meant like the his articles uh, letters were meant to be published, uh, but these ones uh, you know not so much. Uh, <laughs> so uh, getting you know even a little more into the into the mind of Rayo, uh, which I think is interesting. And also one more you know a, a, one more example we touched on. Uh, I think it was an episode, uh, and actually episode one of this podcast, we touched upon uh, Benjamin Best's A Week in the Wilderness, uh, and we kind of got his perspective uh, on the subject. And I guess one thing to keep in mind here with this one is I think it was, it was first published in like 1987, uh, around the same time that Benjamin Best were. So uh, this one is 16 years after, uh, you know, he actually did this. So another thing to keep in mind, you know, his, his memory might not have been as good as he thought it was. Uh, so just something to kind of uh, keep in mind. There, but I do think uh, uh, Benjamin Best was more of kind of a positive outlook on uh, on Rayo and Vani Week, uh, and this one is uh, it's, it's this one isn't Vani Week. Uh, this was just uh, you know kind of a spur like a, I guess a, a random visit. But uh, you know uh, Jim Stum had a little bit of a, uh, a different outlook, so I think it'll be interesting to kind of uh, take a look at that. So let's get into it. All right, quote: Now and then, people ask me what happened when I visited Tom and Roberta in Oregon in 1971. 
Twice I've written an account of my visit in private letters, but I've been reluctant to tell the story in print in the past for reasons that have mostly faded away by now. So the time has come to tell all. I was corresponding with R.L. Gifford during 1971. He wrote Liberty uh, Libertarian Connect. He wrote in Libertarian Connection in Bonnie Life using the pen name of Orion. Gifford was living in Oregon, camping out at Jack's place in contact with Tom and Roberta, having been hired by them to pick up their mail from their P.O. box in Grants Pass. G was encouraging me to come out, painting a rosy picture of an embryonic vanuous community uh, there with great potential for growth. I was ready to make a change anyway, and, and in September 71, after quitting my bank job in Buffalo, I drove to Oregon, intending to stay. The final push that led me to make my move at that time was Nixon imposing wage and price controls on August 15th, uh, 1971. Uh, what better place to do it uh, than with Tom in, uh, in Oregon? Uh, and he said he's going to go underground. So uh, let's move forward just a little bit here. Uh, quote, G had sent me directions to a squat spot outside Grants Pass where I was to meet him. The spot designated Grants Pass NE7, described in uh, Vanu Life 2, page 8. I found it at dusk on the fourth day of my trip and settled down there for the night. Next day, I went to Grants Pass to announce my arrival. I wrote a postcard address to the Vanu P.O. box and dropped it in a mailbox. Then I went looking for the GP mail drop, which I found easily. A five-gallon Olympic paint can and a pile of rubbish behind a garage on an alley at a certain address. I left a second message in the drop and returned to my squat spot to await contact feeling deliciously conspiratorial, as you can imagine. <laughs> G showed up later that afternoon, having picked up my message in the drop. We drove to Jack's place in my car. G had no car, rode a bicycle, and quote. And I'll stop there for a moment. I, I love that, like, especially with, like, Benjamin Bess, when, uh, you know, the security culture that Vanuans had uh, was incredible. You know, mail drops, uh, you know, using uh, landmarks rather than addresses. Like, it's pretty, pretty, you know, I, I, I love that stuff. Yeah, it's very, it's like, you know, very reminiscent of, you know, the, the early days of the spy culture, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they, they're still using the old school type methods, which is, which is great because a lot of people, you know, when technology comes along, a lot of people think, oh, the technology, we have this, this is better. It's like, yeah, but you know, the smart person always thinks, well, what happens if that technology fails? Then what do I have? So you still use these older methods and they're tried and true, you know, why, why, why not take advantage of them? You know, I, I learned a lot of stuff like that studying the abolitionists and uh, it's kind of the same type of stuff that they did, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, masking what they were doing, um, but being able to do it in plain sight. And this is another example of that. You know, there these things are still technically in plain sight, but most people just don't, just are on, you know, it's, it's they're unassuming to most people. So, yeah, why not make use of it? Exactly, exactly, and I and I agree with you. I mean, it's a lot of these a lot of these older methods, you know, are tried and true, and people kind of forget about them. Uh, but there are ways to kind of blend uh, blend. Uh, you know, I think uh, Kyle calls it high tech and low tech, uh, like with encryption. Uh, you can kind of do that. So, so I mean, yeah, if you're if you're really you know worried about privacy, uh, then uh, you know uh, you know maybe no, you know, don't forget about the old methods. But let's get back into it. Quote: As soon as I began to learn details about the situation there, I began to find it much less attractive than I'd imagined it would be. Okay, uh, skipping down a little bit here. Upon arrival at Jack's place, I found it very different from what I had imagined. I suppose it looked like uh, I suppose it looked like way back in the woods to G, a city boy from New Jersey, but not to me. I'm a city boy myself, but I've spent a lot of time in the Adirondack Mountains of New York State, once hiking alone for three days without seeing another human being. Jack's place looked to me like an like the outer suburbs, thin second growth woods. Apparently, Jack had purchased about five acres from some farmer in the access road that dead-ended at Jack's house passed right by the farmer's front porch, which is maybe a quarter mile from Jack's house. So the farmer had full view of all comings and goings. It wasn't at all the secluded, secluded place I was looking for, end quote. So I, I don't know, you know, I, I understand where uh, Mr. Stump's coming from here. I'll be completely honest uh, and, and and say, you know, if I, were, if I were him, I would be a little skeptical too. I mean, he's been, you know, reading Vanu Life for... Uh, you know, for years and reading about, you know, Ray and Roberta's hardcore Vanu living. And he rolls up to, you know, Grants Pass, Oregon. And this is what he sees. It's like, well, this is, this is a little, uh, this isn't what I expected. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it was, it was, it was already in part of the section either that you read or skipped over, but he, it seemed that he, this guy, uh, uh, Stum was actually getting a lot of his information, not just from reading the, the publications and stuff like that, but also he seemed to have direct contact with G uh, before this and was, uh, you know, G was basically painting this much rosier picture of what was going on there. So when he showed up, he's like, wait a minute, this isn't at all what I read in the brochure. I'm very confused. <laughs> right, right. And yeah, that that's, that's definitely true. I, I think Stum and Rayo probably exchanged some letters, but yeah, I think the, the main contact was 
uh, you know, uh, R.L. Gifford. So, uh, so yeah, not some, not, not very good information, but we'll, uh, you know, uh, we'll move forward here. It gets, it gets a little more interesting. Quote, that evening as G and I sat around a campfire eating popcorn, G told me that a meeting with Rayo was set for the next day, Sunday. We would be driven to where Rayo was staying by a guy in the real estate business who was a friend of Rayo's. Then, so I wouldn't be surprised and confused, G went on to tell me that I hadn't known before, th uh, tell, tell me what I hadn't known before then, that Rayo and Tom were one and the same person. I was going to meet Rayo, and the real estate guy, real estate guy was always, call, always called him Tom. <laughs> that meant Rayo's free mate, wife, Dr. Naomi Gatherer, was Roberta. I also learned that Roberta sometimes used the pen name Halen Hygieia. So I had been expecting to find a somewhat loosely associated Vanu community consisting of at least six people. Gifford, Tom, Roberta, Rayo, Gatherer, and Halen. Turned out there were three people and some pen names. That put G's claims about a Vanuist community in a different, less favorable light. End quote. So, uh, yeah, Kyle and, I, Kyle and I always knew uh, that, uh, uh, you know, thanks to John Fisher, uh, you know, he came out and said it, you know, Tom, you know, Tom and Ray were the same person. So we didn't have to worry about that. But, uh, yeah, we came across, you know, three different names for, uh, you know, uh, you know, as freemates or freemates plural. And uh, we did, you know, speculate a little bit. And uh, I guess we were right on a speculation that it was the same person. Uh, but, yeah, apparently, uh, you know, G wasn't, uh, you know, feeding him good information. And uh, I would be a little disappointed, too. You know, if you're, if you're expecting to go to, uh, you know, six people wouldn't be a bad, you know, little, you know, Vanuist community. But uh, you show up and it's, uh, you know, three people and you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we actually on that point about the uh, the confirmation here now, because I, I remember I recall you guys talking about that you know multiple times in you know different episodes about you know when these different names would come up and you guys did kind of speculate on that. It, was this the act? Because when I read this before, when you when you sent this to me earlier and I was reading it before we did the show, I was like, my first question was, was this the first con like actual confirmation you guys had of that 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 in all the reading and all the uh, writings that you've read so far, or had you guys actually come across anything else before this? Nope, this was the confirmation. Wow. Yeah, this, is, this, yeah, this, this was it. That's, uh, yeah, that's, it. well, like I said, you guys, you guys, you guys seem to be pretty spot on. I mean, it made, it made sense, but yeah, I can, I, I feel, I feel for this, this Jim Stum guy. Cause like you can, like you said, it's, it's one thing to think, Hey, okay. You know, this is an idea that's, you know, relatively, well, actually very radical and, and very, you know, relatively out there. Most people aren't even considering it. So to even have six people involved in this type of community already, that's a, you know, pretty big deal. And to have it halved when you get there, yeah. Yeah, that's got to be a shot to the gut. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it, that's, you know, that's kind of been the case for other, other libertarian projects, too. One comes to mind immediately. Uh, Roy Halliday, who uh, was one of the first immigrants to Operation Atlantis, uh, you know, he said that Werner Stifel made it seem like former, former people involved, uh, you know, than, than there actually were, too. Uh, he, he talked about, you know, dozens upon dozens of people coming to the hotel on Sunday when, they, when they'd have their, you know, I guess, informational sessions. And they used to, there's typically like only two or three people there. Uh, and he would announce that, uh, you know, a new corporations getting involved in the Operation Atlantis project when it was just Warner Stifle opening up the corporation himself. So uh, so I guess there I guess I kind of understand. Uh, uh, and this, you know, this wasn't Rayo's wrongdoing. This was, uh, you know, geez, this was uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, R.L. Gifford. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I do understand kind of the inclination to make it sound sexier than it really is. Although although what could what could <laughs> what could, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jim Stum expect? I mean, this is Wilderness Vani. Like, it's not sexy. It's not, you know, romantic. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing like that. Uh, it's just what, it's what Rayo decided to do to, you know, pursue his personal freedom and pursue uh, and vulnerability to coercion. Uh, but, you know, Wilderness Vani was not sexy. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. <laughs> Definitely not a word I would use to describe it. No, no. So I don't know, I don't know where he was kind of I don't really. I guess we'll, we'll we'll get some more insight into that here. Uh, it'll 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 start to make more sense. But uh, quote: Next day, I walked with G across fields and through woods to the real estate guy's house, and he drove us to some rural land he owned where Tom was staying. He drove by a roundabout route, it seemed, so I wouldn't learn the way. Very James Bondish, but it wasted on me. I wasn't making mental notes. I believe this was a place where Tom stored stuff in five-gallon cans stashed in the woods, and he was there temporarily sorting through his stuff. It was a nice meadow near woods with a stream down a hill and a long view off down a valley. No houses in sight. Dead end dirt road led to the uh, dead end dirt road led to the led to the meadow. We spent the afternoon sitting in a circle near Tom's camper and overturned five gallon cans, munching on walnuts and talking. I've forgotten what was talked what we talked about. My overall impression of Tom was favorable. He appeared forty-ish, skinny, but tough, Gandhi-esque looking. Oh, that's a weird description. Uh, <laughs> Strong-willed, kind of a kind of a suspicious guy. No one would call him warm and friendly, but could rely on him to, f to fulfill any contract or promise he had made. But I knew most of that from his writing. He was, however, something less than the libertarian hero 
I had built him up to be in my mind, and I was beginning to have doubts about Isvani's strategy. For one thing, he was dead set against owning land, but here he was using land owned by someone else to store his supplies, depending, depending on favors from his friends to make up deficiencies in his own program, it seemed to me. So, end quote, we'll stop there. So, yeah, I guess he kind of had a, uh, seems like he had kind of this conception that Rayo was yeah, kind of a, you know, his great man who will lead him to, you know, invulnerability to coercion or to, you know, ultimate freedom. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you can understand his disappointment. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like like we've already touched on, and 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 you've re you've read about, you know, the guy uh, the guy who the guy who went by G uh, did kind of build this build this you know help build this idea in Jim's head. But it does also. You're, I think you're right. I, I didn't even like. I read this before, and I, I didn't even pick up on that. But the you know the whole idea of him seeking out a great man. I, I think that's a great observation because that really, you know, hear, hearing that again, that that really does kind of seem what you know between hearing you know between all the readings that he did, and then having these conversations or these or these you know correspondence, I guess, with G, um, and him helping build this image up on his head. It really does seem that he latched onto this idea that he, we have like this the true libertarian hero here out in the woods trying to prove to everybody how this can be done um so he really you know he it seems it wasn't only it wasn't only g that let him down he seems to uh, have have uh, let himself down by uh you know putting all you know projecting all this stuff onto rayu that really uh was undeserved i guess well maybe not not necessarily undeserved but uh you know what wasn't even necessary he just right. you know Maybe he was looking for. He, maybe he would. Maybe what that, that was his problem is that he was actually seeking a hero rather than seeking, um, you know, freedom. Um, <laughs> yeah, a mentor. You know, someone that could help him get started. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah the, the hero thing. Yeah. Uh, and and also, I mean, kind of what we talked about. You know, a moment ago. You know, he was he's saying that uh, he doesn't like owning land, but he's using land owned by somebody else. Uh, which is yeah exactly what uh, you know you're kind of uh, you're talking about those the folks that were doing the intentional community thing. Uh, yeah. So I, I understand where he's coming from, but like this isn't this is a subject Kyle and I did. We did one episode on liberty under attack called ethical land use, and this came up in the oh gosh what episode was it? Maybe on acquisition of private property was that was the episode we talked about it here on the Vonnie podcast. But you know Ray was very upfront about this. You know like this isn't something that you know he kind of left uh, you know kind of a mystery. No he. Ray was very open about, uh, you know, so-called private property ownership uh, that involves more ties to the state, uh, leading to more vulnerability to coercion, not less. So, uh, so yeah, you know, having kind of that proxy, that landowner proxy, uh, I think is a wise idea. I don't think it's, uh, you know, something to, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, smack Ray about. Yeah, and I, I mean, and and again, the the way he writes about this, um, you know, he he seems he 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 puts it out there like it's some contradiction in terms, and I don't see how it's a contradiction at all, even even without him being explicit about you know his feelings on pri on on private property. Just the fact, just the fact alone that he, you know, if you want to put the idea out there that he was against the idea of private property, just like that, without even the reasoning. Um, making use of somebody else's private property how is that you know that's not a contradiction so it's it's i still don't see it as a problem <laughs> i think no. uh this i think this might have been part of his 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 own letdown from you know building this guy up and just wanting to maybe lash out a little bit because i you know i, I don't see i don't see i don't see anything wrong with this so him being uh, maybe a little upset or perturbed about this this whole notion or or thinking it's a problem uh, i think he's just kind of making that up in his head <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so too. I think so too. Well, let's let's find out what. Uh, uh, only read one sentence here for Roberta, and we'll discuss. But uh, quote: Roberta was a big, strong woman, overweight though not grossly fat and hairy, kind of masculine. Uh, I guess I, I'm not going to read. I'm, I'll just paraphrase this. But apparently, she was carrying like they. She had to you know fill up some five cans, five gallon cans of water, and she uh, you know carried them down to the creek. It wasn't a short walk. Stum thinks they weighed about 40 pounds each, and, you know, he looked at this woman and he said, how the hell is she going to carry these back up? Uh, so, like, that just kind of give you an idea of, of, of kind of what what Roberto was like. He, he helped her out. He helped her carry one of the cans up. Um, but uh, that's 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 the first time we've actually gotten a description of, of, of Roberta or Halen or Dr. Gather, whatever you want to call her this week. It's uh, not, which... the most, not, not the most flattening one either. You know, <laughs> a big, strong woman, not grossly frat. But hairy <laughs> and kind of masculine. <laughs> right, right. No, yeah, not, not, yeah, not a very, you know, uh, pretty picture. But I, I guess, and, and we, we, we uh, Kyle and I talked about this when we were trying to figure out, you know, is this one person? Is this three people? And uh, you know, it's, it's so uh, just imagine today when you know governments, you know, you know, worse than it was then, arguably, right? Uh, just imagine, you know, trying to find one person that would be will willing to do wilderness fauna, and then look back you know, in the 1960s. 
uh, finding three people, three women, you know, out there in the woods to, to do wilderness fawning. It was very easy to kind of, you know, deduce that it was just one person. Um, yes. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Any, anything else there? Uh, no, uh, except the only thing is I, I think actually, I think, uh, I think you might have misspoke because she actually, he tried to carry the, one of the things for her according to, according to his own words. Um, but before he, before he could react, he, she had taken off up the hill again with both, uh, cans in tow and he was just oh. like, um, he just stood there in amazement watching her. Okay. So, oh, she, I misread she, that then. So, so, okay. So she was, oh, she was a big burly woman then. She, yeah. Uh, like she okay. took the, she took 80, you know, according, you know, according to his estimations, 80 plus, you know, 80 plus pounds of, of, can, of cans, you know, hoisted up on her shoulders and just walked up the hill with them. And I, I actually, actually, no joke. I filled up a uh, two, five gallon, you know, jugs of water yesterday. And yeah. Those aren't light. Those aren't yep. light. They aren't fun to carry, but yeah, she was a big burly woman then. So, uh, so yeah, there's our kind of description of, 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 of Roberta. Uh, very interesting, but let's get back to it. Quote, next day I took my car into Grant's Pass to have the blown muffler replaced. It had blown in the Midwest where Toyota dealers were then as scarce as fish feathers. So I drove it, noisy as it was, out to Oregon. That afternoon, or maybe it was the next day, Tom and Roberta drove the camper over to Jack's place. As they drove in, they had a small accident that made a big impression on me. The camper had a glass door on the back, uh, like a patio door. They carried a small trail bike outside strapped on the back. As Tom drove up the washboard road, the camper started bouncing. Before he could, uh, before he could get get it to stop, the trail bike trail bike had slammed against the glass back of the camper a couple times and cracked it. When that happened, the thought occurred to me that now Tom will have to go back into that society to get a replacement for the glass. And it struck me as more than an isolated problem. It was also an exemplar of a uh, it was also an exemplar of a fundamental defect of his Bonnie strategy. He claimed to be free of that society in some sense, and yet at any moment. An unexpected event like this might require him to go back into that society for repairs or spare parts if he wasn't to suffer a decline in his way of living. He depended on that society utterly for equipment in general and for most of what he consumed. He was living on the fringe of that society rather than actually out of it, end quote. So I suppose I can understand why he kind of had that, uh, that impression, but that's the whole reason why Rayo formulated the concept of import-export. Uh, that's why he talks about it endlessly uh, in publications, it seems. Uh, you know, these things happen, and, uh, you know, Ray and Roberta did go on, uh, you know, they went on long stretches without any interaction with the Serval Society. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure there are times when, you know, they're out there in the woods for, you know, six months. Uh, other times where they had to make, you know, a couple trips in a month to, you know, replace something. Uh, that just makes sense. And plus, uh, you know, Rayo openly said many times that, uh, you know, he wasn't trying, he was trying to achieve, va achieve Vanu, not self-sufficiency per se. Uh, <laughs> because he wanted to spend time building shelter. Uh, he found that to be more important and, you know, a better use of his time than trying to manufacture everything himself. And since it was just only those two, really, uh, and he was struggling to find people to trade with, uh, you know, division of labor and all, you know, it's saved time and money for them to just, you know, go to, back to the Servile Society to pick those things up. So, yeah, I think he's a little harsh here. Uh, I, think he, I think he's a little harsh. Yeah, this is this is another one of the these moments where I, I when I when I read this and then again hearing you know hear, hearing it hearing it read again, my my initial reaction both times was either this guy didn't read up as much on Vanyu as he as he is you know he made it seem that he did because he he you know he seemed like he understood this stuff or at least what had been put out there so far because obviously he missed all the times Rayo had mentioned these things um or he's just being unnecessarily harsh because he was let down because of the vision he had built up because again every everything I've heard uh you know I read and heard about Vanyu so far from, from listening to the podcast and following some of the you know some of the stuff you guys have put out there uh, it seems that Rayo was very clear about these things. That the, the goal was to, uh, you know, limit. It, what I mean, the, obviously, the utopia is to get rid of the connection to the servile society at all. But reality dictates that most likely your your goal is to limit <laughs> your interaction with the servile society, not cut ties with it altogether because it's near impossible um, in most situations. I think, right? I mean, so that just mm -hmm. it just seems that he. You know, is either purpose is either is either is just mad or he's like trying to purposely uh, mislead people um, with, with I mean, you know, again, I don't know. I don't know how public this this letter originally was supposed to be. But this just this statement alone is just, you know, he, he seems very misleading that he um, either was completely ignorant of all this, of everything that Rayo said beforehand or that he realized it and is just like, oh, well, let me just uh, basically build a straw man here so I can beat that ever living heck out of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, and, I, and yeah, that's that. You're you're exactly right. You know, uh, you limit the interaction with the cerebral society, and also keep in mind too. Uh, uh, and this is gonna be a point I was gonna say for later for a different part, but but keep in mind that the technology, the technology then versus now. Uh, you know, uh, Rayo didn't have Amazon where he could order a new muffler for his, you know, his camper. Uh, he didn't, uh, you know, like the, the, there was that kind of technological aspect too, where, uh, you know, the uh, he had to go to the Servile Society for some of these things. He couldn't, you know, find. Uh, uh, he, he, yeah, he had to, he had to he had to utilize the state, the state of Servile Society. Now today, uh, you know, with kind of the uh, I guess the telecommunications and infrastructure, maybe. Uh, it could be limited even, you know, even, you know, more significantly. But again, I think there's going to be just some things like, uh, I think one example I've used before is, uh, you know, my computer breaks. I can't, you know, build a part for my computer. I just can't do it. So I'm going to go into the Servile Society uh, and get it myself. If I try to build that computer part myself, you know, by trying to learn, uh, it'll take me, you know, months and it'll be a lot of wasted time and effort. Now, it might be a good skill to have at some point, but, uh, but it's just kind of, uh, you know, that uh, is it really worth it? Uh, is it really worth Rayo to, you know, uh, you know, find a, you know, try to, I don't know, how do you, how do you, how do you even make glass? Uh, I don't even know how you yeah. do that. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think he's, he's being a little harsh here too. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, moving forward, quote, but to this day, I remain convinced that the camper nomadism is a way to live in reasonable comfort and expensive ex and expensively say on $2,000 a year or less today. So living that way would give you, would give you a lot of freedom, not from the state, but from obnoxious employers. Such a low income would also free you from paying income tax and reduce what you pay in sales tax. And if you spend a lot of time out of sight in the wilderness, you can ignore a lot of annoying regulations, but it will not make you invulnerable to coercion. That overstates it. And if you get rid of the camper and move into a tent to increase freedom by getting off the roads and doing, doing away with the need for driver's licenses and vehicle registrations, that would reduce your comfort levels to below what I would find acceptable on a permanent basis, end quote. So at least he's being, he's, he's being very honest here. I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 my dream is obviously minimal sailboating, but the more I look at van nomadism, you know, the more the more attractive it kind of is. Uh, you're not having to deal with property taxes and, uh, you know, paying rent each month. Uh, that'd be nice. Definitely the advantages there, I, I think, are, are good. Uh, but again, I think he, he kind of, you know, puts up a straw man here. Rayo uh, never said, well, obviously the goal would be complete invulnerability to coercion, but that's not possible. You want to become as, as you know, as, as invulnerable to coercion as you possibly can be. Uh, so, yeah, I, <laughs> and, Ray, and and also, too, Ray was very upfront about this uh, when it came to the slave tax. Uh, he, he bitched about it a lot, and, and rightfully so. Uh, so, uh, so I, I guess maybe more honesty there from, from Mr. Stum, I think. Yeah, but, you know, but like, again, like you said, it's, it's it just, I, I think, I think this, this basically is just another straw man or, or he just, or he's just completely ignorant of all the times Rayo had mentioned this previously, <laughs> that this was a reality that you would have to deal with if this is the route you're going to take. Um, but I do agree. I, I think it, I mean, I, I've said before, if I, if I didn't have kids, I, at this point, I probably would be living a van, I probably would be living a van nomadism life in some type of camper. Um, because I, I was, I was intrigued, I was intrigued by that idea already. And then after I hung out with a couple of people who had them just, just, you know, they're not living out of them. They just have them for fun. Um, I was just like, oh yeah, I could totally do this <laughs> without kids. Totally, totally live this lifestyle. And, uh, you know, and again, it, it wouldn't make me in, uh, invulnerable, but it would make me a heck of a lot less, you know, <laughs> or a heck of a lot more rather, because, uh, you know, I wouldn't have to deal with all those additional things like the property taxes, and and stuff like that. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and also too, I, I mean, yeah, the, so the the slave tags are obviously bad, and uh, you know, so-called uh, using the so-called you know uh, public uh, government roads uh, is bad too. But uh, I think something you know, Mr. Stum is uh, you know kind of not really taking into account here, and maybe you know, maybe I I, I can understand it uh, at, at this point. Uh, but again, he should have read you know other publications. You know, they really weren't. They were pretty much you know right outside of Grant's Pass. They weren't out in the middle of the wilderness, uh, you know, where Rayo actually liked to be. Uh, but in most of the spots Rayo stopped, I mean, he was pretty much uh, you know way out there in the woods. Uh, you know, if you're way out there and there's absolutely nobody around, uh, I think that would uh, you definitely make you more invulnerable to coercion. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's something he's kind of you know, maybe not uh, taking into account here. Uh, yeah, if you're, uh, I know people uh, uh, that do uh, city squatting uh, in their uh, uh, in their vans, or at least uh, one guy, Alex Ansari, uh, and you run into some problems with that. But uh, uh, that would definitely, you know, that, that would kind of be contrary. If Rayo, you know, city squatted all the time, I can understand that critique. Like, okay. Uh, yeah, you're you're not you're not very invulnerable invulnerable to coercion here, bud. But uh, that's not uh, what Rayo typically did. And plus, you know, towards the towards the end of uh, I guess our no knowledge of him, uh, he pretty much kind of phased out the the camper to 
maybe like uh, 60% of the time of the year. Uh, and then the rest of the time he lived in the tent. So, uh, yeah, I don't, and this, this would have been 71. So this would have been when they cut down on their camper use anyways. So I don't think he was as, fam fam as familiar with them as, uh, as, as he thought he was. Yeah, it definitely seems that way. Okay, let's move on to this next one here. Quote, another thing I noticed was that Tom and Roberta seemed to form a tight, closed society between the two of them with not much need for outsiders. Hard for any third person to get close to them, more so than other married couples I have known. She was less close to them than he had led me to believe, but not uh, Tom's right-hand man, as I had gathered. And it seemed like G uh, could flit off to anywhere at any moment. He did, in fact, leave for New Jersey a few weeks later, and he never returned to Oregon, although my leaving may have influenced him, to, uh, influenced him in that. I saw no evidence that any other persons were likely to join the Vanu community. So where did that leave me, I wondered. Pretty much on my own if I stayed in Oregon. And I had to do something fast. It was almost October, winter coming, nights were already cold, and I could see that my camping gear wasn't adequate for winter camping, end quote. So that's an interesting observation, and that's not, not really surprising. I mean, you consider two people like with, with that much like mine, where they did Wilderness Vanu, uh, you know, being that close. You know, I can imagine that. I mean, they're out there by themselves in the wilderness. I mean, how, how, how are they not going to get close? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you weren't already, it's kind of, you know, and, and, and le unless one of you ends up getting so frustrated that you leave, you, you kind of have no choice but to do that because you're, de you're dependent on only e each other at that point. Uh, for almost yeah. for almost everything, so yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I would I would imagine any, pretty much anybody would have some, you know, even if they didn't have some type of bond beforehand, you kind of build one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true, and and, and apparently they they kind of have their own division of labor going. This will come out with Vani Life March 1973, but uh, Haley Roberta, Doctor Gather, whatever you want to call her this week again, uh, she kind of handled most of the food, and Rayo kind of handled the. Uh, the cleaning, I guess. So uh, they kind of had their specialized tasks, too. Not that they weren't, uh, I guess, weird to say it this way, but not that they weren't cross-trained uh, to do both things. But uh, they kind of had their own roles, and uh, and, and they, that's kind of how they manage things. So I'm not I'm not surprised at all. Uh, and again, he shouldn't have been surprised either, although I guess he, he did kind of have that negative notion going in that, uh, you know, there are already, you know, uh, three other people there uh, when that uh, really wasn't the case. So uh, I guess one other thing, yeah, the, the Vanu community, uh, yeah, you know, Ray was was very open about that, uh, you know, during that time too. So he 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 had that information from from G, but uh, you know, towards the end of that time, just a few short years later, Rayo kind of gave up on it altogether. And this would have been the time where he was kind of, uh, I guess, almost swearing off, you know, working with others completely. So uh, if he's doing that in his publications, then do you really think he's working with others? Do you think really think there's a community? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. So I. I, I you know, and I, I th Stum was definitely familiar. I mean, he had he had publications from from Preform, from Vanu Life, from Innovator. Uh, you know, he was he had a lot of these publications. So I don't know how he you know kind of looked over that. Uh, but I guess maybe he didn't pay as much attention. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and move forward here uh, and get this first one uh, wrapped up. So, quote overall, finally, Tom and Roberta struck me as as a as a quite nice couple, like a friendly rural couple, a little shabby looking, the sort you'd find on a remote homestead uh, somewhere, and be happy to have your have for neighbors. But I had been expecting much more. They fell far short of the superhuman libertarian heroes I was expecting. <laughs> there didn't really seem to be any room for me and their little community, us against the world. So I decided I might as well go back east, end quote. So there we go again. I mean, it's this it's kind of, uh, yeah, when you when you build up somebody like that, uh, you build up a human being into, you know, some sort of a hero, uh, you're bound to be disappointed. And uh, he definitely was. Uh, and you can just kind of tell by the the, the phrasing that he uses. Oh yeah, you know, again, again, you know, it's like, I mean, he's at least at the very least he's honest about that because you know he mentions this multiple multiple times throughout this piece that you know he had he had built this guy up to be a hero, <laughs> um, but you know it just it does seem that he he tries to take it out on his hero rather than you know his own rather than take responsibility for building somebody like this up in the first place, and yeah, just like I don't know, the more we go through this and now going over like the second and third read of this, it's like. I want to I want to have the benefit of the doubt and say the guy was just ignorant, but it does like you just mentioned he had all these publications. It really seems that he just he he built up this idea of Rayo and what was going on despite the evidence in front of him. So what you know it's not it was it wasn't ignorance. It was uh, you know intention <laughs> intentionally sabotaging yeah. himself almost. Right, right. So just uh, for for the for the uh, sake of time here, uh, so basically, you know, him and uh, you know Rayo, uh, uh, him, uh, the the four of them. So this would have been uh, um, G, Jim, 
uh, and Rayo and Roberta, they sat around talking and, uh, you know, kind of vaguely about, uh, you know, whether, like, uh, where he would stay and how they're going to do this. Uh, I guess uh, um, Stum not really making it clear either way if he's going to stay or leave. Uh, he, uh, he he saw shortcomings in, in the Vaniwa ideas, but he still had a high regard for Rayo, and he didn't want to, uh, you know, the, the evening to uh, end up in bickering disagreement. Uh, so we woke up the next morning, uh, left a note at his camp, and uh, said he was leaving, and, uh, quote, later I wrote to Tom and expressed my doubts about the Vani strategy in writing. Skipping forward just a little bit. Uh, so he's talking about, uh, he, he's kind of saying, well, you know, if I stayed, would, would this Vanu community come into fruition? And then he says, quote, but then I would have missed interesting experiences that I had over the next few years in co-ops in Buffalo. It's, possible to, it's impossible to know what might have happened if I stayed in the West, the road not taken, uh, end quote. So Jim Stum, you know, was there for, uh, you know, just a, a few days uh, and then woke up in the morning without even saying bye to rail. And uh, that was kind of the the end of his uh, his experience with uh, with Rayo. But again, keep in mind this wasn't you know Vani Week proper. Uh, this was just uh, you know a random visit. And we'll hear from Rayo here in a moment. He has some clarifications on things. <laughs> um, so let's let's go ahead and get into that uh, right now. And these are both these are both short letters. So we're going to read the read them in their entirety. Quote. Uh, this is November 1971, uh, written by Rayo. Quote. Your info concerning us being around Grants Pass, uh, GP. A great deal is out of date. A couple of times since we moved to Siskiyou, we lived in the camper in or near GP for several weeks at a stretch. But we haven't done that since last January and don't intend to again. During periods when I am processing mail, Orion did it during uh, August, I hike and ride on motorbike to GP every week to 10 days. This is a fairly long hike ride totaling about three hours one way. During short days of autumn winter, I barely have time to go, process mail, send out initial copies to new subscribers on the spot, do half a dozen shopping errands, and get back in daylight. If something delays me and I don't want, to, if, and I don't start back until dark, the return trip takes about twice as long since I must go much slower for uh, part of the way. I dislike laying over at GP since this means packing along, uh, packing along sleeping gear in cold weather. I have intended to scout and set up an overnight camp stash near uh, near GP, but I haven't gotten around to it. I now find a visit to GP or any town of that society to be rather unpleasant. It's the massive impact of values of that society, I think, values I find distasteful. This represents a change for me from a couple of years ago when I rather looked forward to occasional visits. Orion was recently hassled three times during one, day, one three day stay in or around uh, GP. When we do meet people in or near GP, this tends to misrepresent our lifestyle. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Uh, quote, rec or going back into it, recently we did visit with someone near GP. This is a would-be immigrant anxious to meet us. To do this, we uh, we lived in the camper for several days, parking it on relatively unsecluded private land with permission of owner. After a day, this would-be immigrant left as precipitously as he came. Cold feet, literally, I think. He was tent camping, apparently for the first time in his life. In a subsequent letter, he said that he was rather disappointed with our lifestyle. It didn't seem very vanu, especially our dependence on private land. Also, my visits to GP are unscheduled, especially in autumn, winter, and spring. I don't relish riding the motorcycle in rain and snow. So these are all reasons why we do not wish to meet somebody around GP, end quote. So, so yeah, he, he, he definitely mentions Jim here. He definitely <laughs> mentions Jim. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, they don't uh, like meeting people around, uh, you know, Grant's Pass because, like you said, it tends to misrepresent our lifestyle. Uh, but, you know, he was going there to meet this person. <laughs> so... Uh, so, you know, Rayo went out of his way to, you know, meet up with, with, uh, you know, uh, uh Mr. Stam and, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's what, kind of what it turned out to be. Yeah. At the, well, I mean, obviously there's, there's usually, well, they say two sides, well, maybe three sides to every story. Um, you know, but your, yours, mine and the truth, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely does seem that, you know, there's what, at least Rayo's description of everything, it, it pretty much lines, it does make sense. Um, if they weren't actually living anywhere near there and this, all this was an inconvenience, then yeah, why, you know, he, he definitely is misrepresenting this. And it's funny how, you know, he refers to him as the immigrant, um, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, he definitely singled them out. But it's uh, it seems that wh whoever this was addressed to originally, because he was he's just talking about how the information about uh, Grants Pass in general is kind of faulty. Um, it seems like who who maybe whoever he was addressing this to originally got that information from Jim, because <laughs> the whole thing doesn't yeah. seem like a, obviously the whole thing wasn't written to him because he was he's mentioned you know separately at the at the at the bottom here. But. 
So. Right, and and so so the apparently the letters that uh, um, that Jim got, uh, Jim Stam, the the way that he got these letters is from one of uh, Rayo's correspondents uh, out in California or out in the West somewhere. I'm guessing it was John Fisher. I don't know that for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, that's so he he got these letters from somebody else. So this would be one of you know Rayo's uh, trusted confidants, I guess you could say. Uh, so yeah, this definitely wasn't written to 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 Jim, uh, but Jim uh, writes a response. Um, uh, back to Rayo here. Um, but uh, let's see, what's uh, what else do we have here? Uh, quote, now that we are at our winter base camp, we are better able to meet with people. We will meet them at a vehicle squat spot, which is several miles from our base camp. The squat spot is roughly 50 miles from GP on all weather roads, gravel part of the way. The squat spot is, is accessible for the average auto in all but the worst weather. The visitor must bring his own shelter. Upon arriving, he hikes to a particular tree about a half mile away from the squat spot, which we use as a signal flagpole. He puts a combination of flags on the rope and runs them up to announce his presence. About once a day, we climb to a peak near our camp from where we can see the flags with a telescope. One of us, or more, but only one at a time, then go on foot to visit him at the squat spot. We do not have visitors at our base camp. Uh, if we should be out of the area for more than a day, unlikely in winter, we leave a message at a guest message drop near the squat spot. Uh, all factors considered, I think that a visit is worthwhile only for someone who is squatting uh, in the area for other reasons, such as a prospective perspective immigrant who is scouting the area. End quote. So uh, again, I love that. I love the way that he kind of uh, you know gets people there uh, <laughs> using flags, and then he you know spots a flag with a telescope. I mean, what the, what the <laughs> hell is he thinking? Hey, yeah, hey. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna in, invest yourself in the security culture like that, you might as well go all out, right? <laughs> And uh, I just think it's, I mean, again, he's very open about it, but it's like, yeah, once once a day we'll check for the flag. So it's going to be a pain in the butt if you get there first thing in the morning and they don't decide to check until like, you know, the evening. <laughs> Well, and, and, and other and later publications, uh, there's actually a whole section on Vanu Week, which was kind of the he didn't he uh, people would pay him to come out there and he'd teach them how to you know make polyethylene a tents and such and, and how they would you know uh, prepare their food and things. But um, they get a date and a time and they wait 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after. Ah, uh, so gotcha. If someone has to use that flag, it means that they were you know uh, either early or late, uh, probably late. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, they, they won't have to wait uh, that long, I don't think. Hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I like that example uh, and. You know, the, the people who actually met, you know, Rayo, I guess there's only one other example we have now from Benjamin Best, but the people that actually meet him out there in the wilderness, uh, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, maybe it's not, it obviously wasn't for Ben, uh, Benjamin Best or, or, or the woman he was there with, but, uh, you know, the people that have, you know, actually gone to Vanu Week, uh, seeing how Rayo lived, they always have an interesting experience. They never, you know, say, oh, this isn't for me. Uh, but, you know, uh, Jim Stum had a bad experience because... You know, it wasn't, uh, they were, you know, right outside of Grant's Pass, not 50 miles away. Yeah, it seems like he, you know, he, he, he didn't get the treatment. Even even, uh, even Benjamin Best, from what I remember from his, you know, his writings on, you know, what what happened to him. Um, it seems like even he had a, it, it wasn't as, um, you know, completely out of out of basically character for for what they to, you know representing what their lifestyle was um because it's you know from what i remember about his story was he actually got to be closer to where they actually were living at the time um versus doing it in this in this situation so yeah oh yeah and and, and benjamin best got to actually go to their camper and uh, that wasn't that wasn't uh, you know really typical I, I think but one reason benjamin best had a great time too was he was very fixated on a woman but um, or the woman he brought there, but uh, but no, he 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 enjoyed it, and he was uh, apparently Rayo liked uh, liked him and uh, and and uh, like Ben and, and his woman uh, enough to actually let them come to their base camp. So uh, so yeah, you know, Jim Stum didn't get the you know he didn't get the experience. He didn't get the experience. I think if he would have, uh, he wouldn't uh, you know uh, be, be be so harsh. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and move on to what uh, what he what uh, you know Jim had to say um, about uh, this this previous letter. Quote, the would-be immigrant Rayo mentions here in the last uh, mentions here was me. I visited him, his freemate in Orion, in September 1971, intending to move to that area, but I found the situation there to not be uh, at all all that appealing to me, so I returned to New York. Here's the paragraph from my October 71 letter to Rayo in which I mentioned private land. Quote, having seen your lifestyle up close, I now have my doubts as to how invulnerable you really are to state coercion. You generally oppose buying land because this. Here we go again. You generally oppose buying land because this makes you makes the buyer subject to property taxes and various restrictions. Yet you use private land owned by others. Also, if you make it, I'm gonna skip past that part. He's doing the same thing over again. Um, let's see. Uh, quote. It seems to me that if the state takes the easy course of just sharing the sheep, then you won't need so much seclusion and, and abandonment of technology to be reasonably free. 
On the other hand, if the state really tries to root out every resistor, even voluants likely won't escape their net. The trouble is, you are not a separate and independent society. You have to import food, fuel, and spare parts from the coercive society and export labor to make a living. See, hold on, stopping there. He understands import-export. He just described it perfectly. Uh, so, <laughs> anyways, continuing. Uh, and your communications are mainly through the state mail system. This leaves you highly vulnerable through your supply lines. Long-term storage helps with this problem, but the only real solution is to produce everything that you need. I suppose that you can hope to I suppose that you hope to progress in this direction, but I don't see how you can do much without more people, and I don't see how you can attract more people without being able to offer more independence of status servile society, more than a backwoods man type standard of living, and more of a real community of annuance. Each seems to require the other as a prerequisite. It's a dilemma. End quote. <sighs> Again, uh, you know, the 100% self-sufficiency, that's not what Ray was going for ever. Uh, he spoke plenty about that. Uh, we've already discussed the private property thing. We're not going to do that again. Um, uh, yeah, slave tax. We yeah, I skip over I skip over that part. So you guys have to hear that again. But uh, that's interesting. So if the state decides to you know root out all resistors, then venuance uh, you know uh, wouldn't be safe either. Well, let me. <laughs> do you really think the state has you know the time, money, uh, resources, and effort to you know really go out to you know uh, you know scour you know the the massive you know national forest to find people hiding there? I don't think so. And why? The, why would they? Why would they? Why, why would they waste that time, money, and uh, time, money, and effort? It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. They don't know they're they don't know they're there anyways. No, I mean it. It doesn't make sense. No, no. But it, it also like that that whole that whole idea that he's putting forth is is wrong for two reasons. Um, that number one, and even if it were true, even if even if the state did become all powerful enough to be able to try to root out all resistors, as he put it. Um, that's like, you know, one of those lifeboat scenarios that, yeah, if it was the case, you know, it's kind of like when people say, you know, oh, you're putting your trust in Bitcoin. What if an EMP hits and wipes everything out? It's like, OK, then everybody's screwed for everything. Um, yeah, I'm not really worried about my, my Bitcoin exactly. at that point. I mean, we got we got more issues so, here. <laughs> so this is the same type of thing. If everybody's be, if everybody's a target at that point, then everybody's a target. That's not a knock against a particular ideology or lifestyle or whatever, because it's a knock against all of them. That's just, it's a, it's a ridiculous right, argument. So, <laughs> so so if so if the state decides to you know just go out and you know you know what uh, uh, you know drop bombs and murder people in the street, therefore Bonnie doesn't work. Exactly. Okay. There you go. There all you right. go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and probably the, the probably the most and this was the, the this was the instance I was going to bring up the technology aspect, but he he knocks him because he uses you know USPS to send out mail, and it's it's, it's okay you know I mean they, they, it's a monopoly they like they if you're sending little you know parcels of paper you have to go through you know USPS. Yeah, this uh, was 1971. Did FedEx and UPS even exist back then? I actually I actually looked that up. I was curious. So. Uh, FedEx and DHL weren't around until eight, 1971 and 19, uh, 1971 and 1969, respectively. Uh, UPS was around uh, since 1907. Oh, wow, okay. uh, so, I mean, so so UPS would have been around, but you know, so for Vani Life, I mentioned this in one of the episodes, but the the, the uh, print is so small; it's 80,000 words packed into like 20, uh, you know, like 20 sheets of paper, essentially. Wow. Um, and the, the the print is extremely small, so the extremely frugal Rayo isn't just going to not you like he's not going to pay three or four times as much for the mail uh, even if he could send it uh, that way he wouldn't just do that through ups and plus i don't know how you know widespread ups was in in 1970 i really have no idea and and you consider they were you know grants pass and and kind of uh, you know the cave junction area i think it's cave junction those are you know those are still you know relatively they aren't large towns now so back in the 70s i don't even know if like ups would actually you know be, would actually deliver out there so this is kind of knock against him using you know usps i mean Okay. <laughs> it was pretty much <laughs> it was pretty point? much the only option because yeah, and now, now now some of this is starting to come back to me. Um but I'm pretty sure like the like it was actually the introduction and and the the later competition between FedEx and UPS and all that stuff that actually drove um letters to be able to because be, before that it was just it was essentially just for big packages and stuff. So I don't even think like the normal just transference of letters would have made any sense on any level, <laughs> even if he did have even if he did have access to UPS way out there in the in the sticks. You know, so yeah, exactly again, it's one of those nonsensical arguments because he's just basically um attacking the guy for not having another option of being able to connect to people before yeah, so the days of tel of cell phones. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so Mr. Stum, what, what do you suggest? You enjoyed reading his publications. I mean, you, you loved it so much that you published, uh, you know, this, you, you published, uh, you know, all the stuff 16 years after the fact. You just wanted to not use state mail and, and just not, you know, do any of these, these mailing newsletters or anything. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, and, and, and Rayo mentioned this. I mean, uh, Rayo mentioned that, you know, Va what was Vanu today, what's Vanu today may not be Vanu 50 years from now. And was Vanu, you know, 50 years ago may not be Vanu today. Uh, and you know one of the major you know drivers of that is technology. So fortunately, it's a, it's a lot easier for for us. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's it's really not that big of a problem today. I mean, you consider uh, we, we you know we can order things off Amazon uh, and have them delivered through private companies if we want to. I mean, don't have to go through the state for that. Uh, we have you know the the internet, which largely eliminates the need for you know sending pieces of paper in the mail. Uh, so I mean that's that's not even really an issue anymore. I just wanted to, to point that out, but. But yeah, that just really seems like a dis. I think he was just trying to find things to, you know, point more, out. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. Know. More and more, this guy is just seeming like a scorned lover, <laughs> <laughs> or or not even a scorned lover. Just you never took the trash <laughs> out. You never washed the dishes. Actually, it's not even that. It's more like a a, a, a scorned stalker. You know, somebody who sat there and idolized, you know, and just like worship this person from afar, and then they get their chance, and they're they're shot down, and now they just want to try and trash the person. <laughs> Because, because ba based on uh, Rayo's response to it, Rayo's, you know, Rayo's uh, description of him, it didn't seem like he really wanted him around anyway, because you know. That's that's true. He didn't. Well, yeah, he didn't even. Uh, and this would have been a private letter. So uh, at that time, he would he didn't know it was going to be of published course. later on. But he could he could have been as like he could have you know spent he spent a lot of time talking about him. He's just like oh you know some other visitor you know that came here, uh, and 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 to that that kind of final point where where uh, you know Jim brings up the the final concern you know regarding you know recruiting individuals into a wilderness Fauna community, uh, kind of that uh, yeah that that dichotomy that, that he points out, uh, or I guess that dilemma rather, uh, you know. <laughs> Ray was, especially. I mentioned this earlier, but around like 1970, you know, was, he was already getting more hostile towards other individuals. Uh, you know, pretty hostile. And just a couple of years later, you know, he decided to, you know, just, just, uh, you know, cut off all the communication. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess that's something to take into account too. You know, Ray was more of a hermit and was extremely picky with, you know, who he decided to associate with. So, uh, the fact that there's not a bonded community yet doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that there aren't people interested. It just means that. You know, Rayo, being the picky person that he was, probably called him controlled schizophrenics, and they probably got you know a little butt hurt <laughs> and decided to leave. I'd, I'd imagine, uh, or <laughs> I, I, would, I would, I would think at least. But, but yeah, sure, there's a dilemma there. But uh, you know, uh, in, in that last letter that Rayo wrote to uh, to John, to, I think it's to John Fisher. Uh, you know, he was just, uh, you know, he didn't want to. Uh, he was pretty much sick of working with people. So that's kind of where, where that ends. Um, so I, I don't know where that kind of uh, where that kind of leaves, uh, you know, that comment for Jim, but. Um, but yeah, you know, Rayo wanted Vanu associations early on and towards the end, uh, of, of what we know that really never happened and, and he just kind of disappeared. So yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else there is to say. Yeah, on that one. I, I don't either. <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, let's see what, uh, what else Mr. Stem has to, you know, uh, the, the scoring lover has to point out here, quote as a, uh, or the stalking lover, whatever. Uh, as for my camping expertise, I had done some camping before in the, uh, Adirondack mountains, but not much. My camping gear was an adequate small pup tent, too thin, too thin a sleeping bag. I recall one morning out there sitting in the sun for a while, warming my chilled bones, but that's all minor stuff. I could have easily bought better gear if I decided to stay. And he points out, uh, just read it, of greater concern I have I have been led to expect by Orion, not by Rayo, that there was an embryonic Vanu community in Siskiyou. I found no one, I found no such thing. Only three people, and one of them, Orion, was a butterfly who could flit off at any moment, and he did, in fact, leave for the East Coast a couple weeks later. Stop, uh, end quote there for a second. At least he points out it wasn't right. Yeah, yeah. He, he... So he, he kind of just said what we've been saying the entire time. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, continuing on, quote, Ray is also referring to me when he says in Vanu Life uh, 5, page 1, warm bodies. One visitor came expecting to count a large number of them and was disappointed because he couldn't. Uh, Rayo goes on there to say that most contributors to Vanu Life are scattered over a wide area and are in contact with each other only by mail. Uh, end quote. And yeah, that was for a purpose. <laughs> Uh, you know, they didn't want to know where each other's base camps were. You know, plausible deniability? Yeah. They didn't want to know at all. Uh, there was one article in Vanu Life, which hasn't been published yet. Um, but um, you're talking about for a Vanu association. Uh, what you would have is you, you'd have your own Vanu home, your Vanu home base is your own Vanu shelters. And there would be a central meeting point that you all knew, but you didn't know where anyone else actually lived. Uh, so, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense, I guess. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, although we, we really don't know that there wasn't, there wasn't uh, you know, meeting up and such. 
but they just didn't, you know, live that uh, closely together uh, by choice or, or otherwise. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, but and again, it, it seems here that uh, you know either he had a Stum had a grand misconception or he's you know purposely um, being dishonest about this because it it seems like he's knocking the knocking the situation for not being an intentional community when that was never promised in this situation. <laughs> No, and again, he read the publications. Yeah, exactly. He like, he read all of the publications where they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm out here in uh, Big Gahung Big Big Tahunga Canyon, uh, you know, looking over the stream here." It's like, okay, he's not where Rayo is, but he's a Vanuan in some other location, uh, and and probably uh, I guess maybe in in Vanu life there might have been you know maybe twelve or thirteen contributors. So there weren't, and that was just that was a, a smaller publication. Um, there were other ones like Preform uh, and Preform Inform and Innovator where there were you know probably uh, you know more contributors than I'm, I'm not aware of. But you know, twelve to thirteen people, you know, still not a you know a small amount of uh, a small amount of folks, and all the people that subscribe to the publications. So uh, he should have kind of known that too. That you know, that's why the the newsletters are there, and that's that's why you know people wrote into those newsletters because that's how they communicated. Uh, they weren't actually there in the same physical location, uh, which should have been uh, you know blatantly obvious. But uh, I don't think this guy's that sharp. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, it really seems that he just like, you know, again, he got bad information and I don't, you know, you can't fault him for that necessarily, but he seems to be taking the fact that he got bad information way too hard. And he also seems to be misdirecting the anger about it. Like he mentions the fact that it was uh, G's fault, but then he's still like so much harsher on Rayo because of it. It does it just doesn't make sense. Right, right. Uh, okay, last uh, last paragraph here, quote. My judgment then was that Wilderness Vanu uh, was too rough a lifestyle to ever attract many people to it. So the prospects of a Vanu community developing were slim. Time has proved that prediction correct. Since my main reason for moving to Oregon was to live in physical contact rather than male contact with like-thinking people, when I found that wouldn't be possible, there was no good reason for me to stay there. Western New York, on the other hand, at least was familiar turf where I knew my way around and had relatives and other useful contacts. Reconsidering now, returning east still seems to have been a correct decision, especially considering that Wilderness Fanu never went anywhere. My only doubt is, I wonder if anything would have changed if I had stayed. Perhaps Orion would not have left. Perhaps other people would have joined us after all. But then, if I had stayed in the West Coast, or stayed in the West, I wouldn't have taken part in founding, Nor founding North Buffalo Food Co-op, and I would have missed the rewarding experience I call my summer at Fred's Farm, and half a dozen fine people I hung out with uh, for a while. End quote. So I think there's there's also another uh, some, some another issue here, which this is this might be why when Ray interacted with him, why he wasn't a big fan of of Mr. You know Jim Stum. He wanted you know he I guess he kind of had this conception that you know Van or uh, that uh, Wilderness Fauna would be like this mass collective movement, because uh, he started a food co-op. Obviously he liked you know I guess kind of that uh, collective aspect. Maybe that's why Ray wasn't a big fan. <laughs> uh, he wanted some he wanted some mass movement, and uh, you know. He was crazy to ever think that would come about with wilderness, wilderness fauna. Yeah, yeah. Again, it really seems that he had this completely different vision. For what reason? I, you know, again, it's it's impossible to know based on the evidence that he seems to have had. You know, like we have this evidence now, but it seems that he had most of it too at the time. So for him to make these incorrect assumptions, and you know, again, going back to something I said earlier about the the comparison between his experience and and Benjamin Best's experience, was that. It seems that Be when Best went out there, Best was just really going out there to investigate it. It didn't seem like he had a lot invested. Like I was, you know, on the a teetering on making a life changing decision by meeting right with Rayo, you know. Whereas Stum definitely seems like he. It says, you know, he said it in the. He drove cross country. Yeah, he, he quit his <laughs> job at working at a bank and drove cross country in four days, um, and with the with the intention of possibly setting up camp and staying there permanently you know on his you know on his way out there he already had his mind set on that so you know and uh you know th that last paragraph he read too i don't know if it's now just my bias against this guy because i you know the whole score and lover thing i have going through my head <laughs> but it really it was like hearing that back i was like oh that seems pretty grandiose of him like he's saying you know i know he's saying well, i don't know what would have happened but then to be very specific about well if i had stayed maybe so and so would have stayed and maybe more people actually would have showed up because <laughs> he said just before that how, how it never went anywhere how does he know that the whole purpose of it was to be disconnected right. from society <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. And I mean, I, I can understand his fru I, I can understand his frustration, but this is something that you know Raya would never recommend. When we talked about when when we started out season two and talking about financial independence, 
uh, if you've got a job in the state survival society, the idea is to, you know, get a nest egg so that whenever you actually go to do what you want to do, you've got that investment capital to buy a boat or uh, buy a van or whatever you're going to do, uh, and then have enough to, you know, uh, uh, you know, to get used to the lifestyle change. This guy quit his bank job. I uh, don't really know if he had a, I don't know how much money he had saved up. He made it seem like he had some, uh, which, which I suppose is good. But, uh, you know, I would have, you know, recommended, you know, keeping the job, you know, going out there and visiting Rayo, uh, you know, not dropping everything to meet, a, to, to go meet a guy for the first time and hope that's what you're going to do with your life. Yeah. Uh, seems very, very careless. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe part of the, may, maybe part of the anger and frustration he's feeling is maybe he feels a little stupid on his part, uh, for, uh, you know, just, um, putting all of his eggs in one basket, I guess. Uh, putting all of his hopes and dreams. He had managed his, his expectations. He really didn't. Uh, yeah, absolutely not. The pro projection definitely seems like uh, something he's uh, quite familiar with because, you know, he projects his anger at himself and, and you know, what little anger he could have at G for misinforming him about some things um, totally on Rayu. So he definitely is projecting all over the place. I think that's a very accurate assessment. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's the second, uh, I guess, the, the second... Uh, I guess I guess case study or or experience that we have of someone meet someone else meeting uh, meeting Rayo and Roberta. Uh, one was for Vani Week, and you know Benjamin Best took away some some very interesting things from there. I don't think he really ever planned on you know staying uh, if I if I recall correctly. Uh, but it was something he was investigating. He did he did what uh, what uh, uh, Jim Stump should have done uh, in the first place. You know do go to a Vani Week rather than some random meetup because he was doing Vani Weeks at the, at this time, or maybe you know later on. I'm not sure, but. Uh, so Benjamin Best's experience was a little better. Didn't decide to, you know, pursue it, but at the same time, he had some nice things to say about Rayo. And uh, um, I, 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 it's just, yeah, two different, two different, two completely different experiences. And uh, <laughs> it's funny with which each, which each, each of these so far, there's some emotional aspect to it too. Uh, you know, Benjamin Best uh, wasn't, you can't really trust his account too much because he was, he just wanted to, you know, he wanted to sleep with the woman he was there with and she wouldn't let him. So he was really fixated on that aspect. And uh, then with, uh, with uh, Jim Stum, he really didn't give it a shot at all. And, uh, you know, he dropped everything to pursue it. So uh, I wish we could get kind of an objective case study here. That'd be really nice. But, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have a whole lot to choose from. So we got to take what we can get. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, I mean, this. So, I mean, really, what what more can you expect? You know, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess, it, it, you know, if, if you had two very positive experiences, then, you know, maybe you'd look better on radio and stuff. But I mean, this is, this is the best you can actually hope for, I guess, when you have, when you only have two sources. <laughs> it's to have right. Now, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not complaining either. I mean, we, we had the, we had that one book for, for about a year and then now we've got a whole bunch, uh, a whole bunch of other publications and maybe in some of the other ones, we'll, we'll, we'll get some more case studies. I'm not sure. I've, I've only dug through. Uh, you know, half of half of one of them, and kind of skimmed over, skimmed over, skimmed over some of the rest. So maybe there'll be some some other ones, and maybe we'll get an actual, you know, objective case study. Um, I hope so. But uh, but regardless, it's good to just have some of this original source material rather than just uh, you know wonder what what was said in these publications. So uh, so Jeremy, you got any uh, closing thoughts for your listeners, sir? Uh, I'm trying. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just, I think I've I just I've repeated myself way too much. This guy, you know, I, I you know, take what take what you will from this guy's account. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's smart to to look at the best, you know, the Benjamin Best account the same way. You know, take what you will from it because of the, uh, you know, his what what he was preoccupied with. Um, but again, you know, they they can't, uh, you know, they they can't. Neither of them can really know because they only experienced for for a very short time, and uh, you know. This guy, Rayu, whatever you think about him, he was actually out there living it for quite a while. Although, you know, one thing did occur to me earlier, um, especially because you said, what would you, what'd you say? You, you figured out the math and he'd be about 84 by now? 80, 86. 86 is how old he'd be, yep. I had a random thought earlier as you were reading part of, part of the, uh, one of the uh, letters, and I was like, you know, you know who would fit the timeline – Cause I don't, how many, like, is there a lot of pictures of this guy? I don't recall there being a lot of, uh, visual aids oh, along for, with, yeah. For Rayo? No, he, cause he, there was, uh, and I knew, I, I, I imagined he, like, with the, with how firm he was on security culture, I didn't think there'd be any pictures of him, but, uh, in, in the same publication that we read the, these articles from, uh, he talked about, uh, it was actually one of the following, uh, following articles, uh, you know, kind of, he was, he was trying to, you know, maybe find a better way to do this and meet people. And he had one idea of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tape recorders and, and maybe video cameras. And, uh, uh, yeah, Rayo wouldn't have, uh, uh, actually, no, he talked, uh, Rayo talked about Polaroids. 
Uh, and he said, uh, take pictures, but not of any, not of any, not of any individuals themselves. Uh, so no, there wouldn't have been any pictures uh, at all. So we don't know what. The well, hell yeah. So the, the, the thought I had earlier is like, based on all that, in, all, the, all that, you know, limited information, I was like, you know, who would fit the pro like who could fit the profile of Rayo and would actually fit in that age demographic. You remember, yeah, and this would be completely conspiratorial, but you know, uh, Mountain Man. I think he's up in Montana uh, or something like that. Who, yeah, who was like guy. a sovereign-esque citizen who, who not necessarily a sovereign, but was always getting into trouble with the law that way. <laughs> I, right, not having hunting or fishing license. Yeah, or something. that, that, yeah, that, that thought guy? that thought crossed my mind earlier. <laughs> I was like, he would actually fit the timeline for that. Maybe that's right. Because <laughs> nobody knows what happened. Maybe to him. you know if yep. he is still alive, yep. he could very Maybe. well be Mountain Man. <laughs> Right, and, and you know, from from being, uh, you know, being, you know, 86 years old, and I, I, I don't know, some people, you know, when when they're in isolation, they kind of go a little nutty, uh, you know, or maybe he got Alzheimer's or something, and he's just, uh, you know, a, a little a little nutty now, uh, you know, maybe, you know, it's possible, <laughs> although, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I, I imagine he's he's dead. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I imagine just it me. too. But yeah, mountain <laughs> man, yeah, mountain man, huh? Huh. It just it's like I said, it just crossed my it popped into my head earlier. I'm like, based on when I remember first seeing those videos, I'm pretty sure he would be around that age range. <laughs> it's just a funny thought, you know. I don't I don't right. I wouldn't put too much stock into it, but you know, if he were still alive. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I think more likely than not, unfortunately, uh Rayo did not survive because you know, like you mentioned earlier and you guys have mentioned before on the show, you know, it definitely seemed like he was he was becoming so frustrated with working with other people, but he still wasn't at a place where he could provide everything for himself. So those two, you know, those two factors, the chances of him being able to survive a very long time out there, just him and Roberta, you know, seems less and less likely, unfortunately. So, right. My, my speculation is, uh, you know, towards the end of, uh, towards the end of recorded history of Rayo, uh, he started to be, become more in favor of completely underground structures. So, uh, I, I'm guessing, you know, he was an engineer, but, uh, you know, uh, human beings make mistakes, and uh, I, I imagine uh, one of his constructions fell in on him. Uh, that's my that's my uh, my my speculation. We had no I no no way of knowing, no way of knowing. But I, I from 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 how hostile he was towards the state of servile society, I don't think he could I don't think he could survive. Uh, you know, just drop everything and go back to a normal engineering job. Uh, I don't think that's possible. I I, I imagine he just uh, you know died out there. Uh, that's that's that's. This seems seems the most rational uh, yes. from from the information that we have. So, uh, so thanks so much for for coming on guest hosting, Jeremy. It's been uh, it's been fun. Yeah, man. Thanks uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, you know, like I said, I'm I'm a fan of the show. I've been learning a lot, so it's uh, it's great to actually take part of it. Right on, right on. Yeah, I couldn't think of a you know a better first uh, first guest for for the Bonnie podcast. So, me um, again, th thank you for, so much for uh, you know being being available on such short notice. It'll give me some more time to edit. So uh, that's always that's that's always a good thing. So I might uh, you go straight back to uh, uh, to uh, digitizing uh, you know the full publication of, of uh, what we just read today. So uh, all right, so we sure hope you enjoyed this uh, intermission episode. Hopefully, uh, no promises as I haven't talked to him, but hopefully Kyle will be available, uh, you know, next week uh, or before next week, so that uh, uh, we'll uh, so that we can, you know, actually get back to recording the normally scheduled episodes. Uh, if so, we'll be talking about free mates and relationships, a subject that, you know, bad time. I was telling I was telling Jeremy this before we uh, before we started recording. Uh, this is the only episode that I could not do myself. Uh, <laughs> Kyle's actually in this in a sort of free mate relationship, uh, so. So yeah, he's got a lot of he's got experience with this. I don't. So this is that's the one episode that I can't do myself. Uh, so hopefully it's available. We can get back to the the normally scheduled episodes. And if not, then uh, then there's plenty of other uh, you know material uh, articles that uh, that I could discuss next week. A really good one. Oh, uh, it's against it's called against social reformism. And uh, it's another one where he kind of uh, you know whether it's. Uh, whether it's the uh, you know the minarchists, the anarcho-capitalists, or the anarcho-communists, uh, he kind of rails against them pretty hard uh, for the collective movementism. So it'll be interesting for the ANCAPs. Uh, you know, just uh, be open, be open. Uh, it makes it very, <laughs> for, it's, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just col any collective movement, uh, collective movementism uh, in general. Uh, and I think it makes very, very uh, sound arguments. So the website is bonniepodcast.com, and we'll talk to you next week.